please give a warm welcome to today's speaker, Ian McLean. Good afternoon. I'm on. Um, so welcome unofficially to the start of the long weekend. <laughs> um, and you know, it's interesting because when Caroline invited me to speak here, I didn't realize until I looked in the calendar to realize that I got the afternoon just after lunch slot on the Friday before the start of the long bank holiday May weekend. <laughs> Sorry. So the one thing that I almost did was uh, I, I thought long and hard about packing a mirror so that I wouldn't be the only person in the room and that at least be one other person in the audience. So I can only conclude on that basis that you guys are the optimistic learners. <laughs> so I better be clear that I don't disappoint you either with your optimism or with your learning. And um, this is my first talk at Google, so uh, I fit into that category. Uh, Caroline, and uh, it's, it's really good to be here and particularly on the run into the long weekend. And we're going to spend a little, little bit less than an hour and I'm going to make it a little interactive. So there's going to be some of me, some of you, um, and then we'll kind of make up the rest of it in between. But uh, I think everybody starts off by telling their story. I'm going to give you a very, very short version of the story. So I'm the founder of a business which is called Flow Group. And I started the business 20 years ago. So it's actually 20 years old this year. And I didn't have any great grand ambitions or plans to be an empire builder. And we built the business pretty slowly, steadily, organically. And we now have a business that has got operations across four continents. Um, and during the last 20 years or so, we've worked with a very, very wide range of organizations. In fact, these are just some of the brands uh, that you'll be familiar with. In the last 10 years alone, we've worked with over 300 different, mostly international organizations in all sorts of shapes and sizes. So many of them are blue chip multinationals. Um, a number of them are sports governing bodies, government agencies, voluntary organizations, NGOs. Um, we're kind of industry agnostic. I think we've worked with 38 different industries in the last 10 years alone. And the one thing that we bring to the party is the common element of people. And um, that's probably the one single variable or expertise that we specialize in. Now, when you looked at the list of things, we call the things down the bottom the centers of excellence. You'll probably be very familiar with them, and you can imagine that that's what an organization that do what we do around people would cluster their activities in under the headings that you see. The one that I put the red circle around is the one which is probably least familiar, if uh, at all familiar to you, which is called Greenline. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about or work with you on this afternoon, is this Green Line proposition. And the reason that I chose this, because Caroline kind of invited us to think about something that would add value and be interesting, is because it didn't exist five years ago. And five years ago, we saw something that was missing in the market, in the organizations that we were working with across the globe. And we created, myself and my co-founder of Green Line, who is based in Toronto, Blair Steinbach, and his background is neuroscience. So he, for almost a quarter of a century, has worked with all sorts of agencies, from athletes to government agencies to military to uh, organizations, business organizations, in the area of how do you perform best under pressure. And that, combined with our own experience and field research, came to create something which we call Green Line. And here's the proposition. So, the title that I've chosen for today is this whole idea of what I've put up on the screen here. So it's a proposition, and there are three key words to share with you or to think about for the purposes of the next hour. The first is effective, effective leaders. I'm guessing that all of us here at this stage in our career have had the experience of what it's like to work under or work with an effective leader. We probably have even more experience of what it's like to work with or work under an ineffective leader. And they are different. And the difference between effective leadership and ineffective leadership is that the effective leader, he or she, has thinking and behaviors 
that cause them to be able to create an environment, which in this world we call culture, which is productive and engaging and gets great work done. And we all probably have the experience of both during our careers at this point. So this whole idea of effective. The second word which is interesting is the OS or the operating system. Because effective leaders with their thinking and behavior probably don't even know what they're doing or how they're doing it, right? They just show up the way they show up with the thinking and behavior and it's underneath the surface. So the idea of an operating system is a very good analogy for this pr proposition. And actually it was brought to our attention working with one of the big four accountancy firms in London. And they were wowed by the Green Line proposition which we're about to explore. And they ran into a challenge because they said, well, hang on a second, where do we deploy this? Because we can see this is so good as a basic, and they called it our operating system. It's going to affect our teams and make our teams better and more collaborative. It's going to affect the way we interact with our, uh, with our key clients and our customer relations. It's going to help with our innovation because we need to be innovative and creative in a changing environment. And it's going to help with our efficiency and our effectiveness by reducing down waste and increasing speed of execution. But it's all under the surface. And we know that the value of the operating system is that if you've got a robust operating system, then you can run more programs simultaneously. You've got higher efficiency and higher speed with your processing. And you get less blue screens of death, which in leadership terms is pretty invaluable. So what we did was, over the last four or five years, we've managed to codify and build the evidence for what is the operating system that differentiates effective leaders from ineffective leaders. And that's what Greenline has become. And one of the other interesting elements of it is, in spite of the fact that we got a pretty mature business 50, uh, 50, after 15 years and five years ago, in the last five years, the Green Line proposition amongst our clients now accounts for 40% of our revenue from a standing start from nil. I'm looking out at the audience here and I'm imagining there aren't many of us that remember there was a motor oil advert in the 1970s. And the tagline for it was, it gets to parts of the engine that other oils don't reach. Well, we found that Green Line seems to get to parts of the organizations and people's psyche that other types of development doesn't reach. So we call it the Castro GTX of development. That's what we are with. <laughs> so for today, I'm going to share with you a few things. The first thing is I'm going to give you a context where this came from, apart from the history. So where does it apply? How does it work? The second thing we're going to do is uh, I'm going to share with you a very simple model, and the model is very simple. The third thing we're going to do is the methodology of the operating system is broken down into, as you'll see here, seven do's and seven don'ts. And we've got cards. We've got seven red cards in the current footballing environment. That's pretty understandable and intelligible what that does. And then we've got seven green cards, which are the very opposite of the red cards. So I'm going to share those with you. And um, that's effectively what we're going to spend our time at this afternoon. There's going to be some audience participation as we go along. I'll engage with you at the appropriate moment and get some input because I'll be very interested in your take on some of this stuff. So let's just talk about context for a second. When we talk about context and we look at business, we look at it as a game of two halves, just extending out the football <laughs> analogy for a second. On one half or on one side of business, you've got what we call the mechanics. And the mechanics are simply the structures and systems and processes and policies, procedures, they all begin with P, the strategies that are necessary to create order in what otherwise would be chaos. So they're very necessary and they create order and they create transparency. So this is the mechanics of business. On the other side, you've got the humanics because I've still yet to see a project deliver itself. I've still yet to see a strategy implement itself. And the interesting thing about business in our experience over the last quarter of a century or so is that when there is a problem and something needs fixing and the business has to go to try to find a solution, where do you think it typically goes? Do you think it goes to fix it to the humanics or to the mechanics? What's your sense? 
almost exclusively it's the mechanics. Let's write a new policy. Let's restructure. Let's tinker with the system or investigate the system. We had a classic example of this with one of the leading banks that moved to an outsource model just over 10 years ago. One of the things that came in, into our orbit was the per performance management area. And they knew they needed to do something with it. So they'd outsourced it and they'd centralized everything. They realized when they did their due diligence that there were 65 different performance management systems out there in the group. And that wouldn't do. So what they decided they needed to do was they needed to find one that was going to be fit for purpose and the silver bullet for all performance management. So they went out and they spent two years investigating, crafting, recrafting, and two years later they came up with the silver bullet performance management system. They ran it for six months. After six months, they abandoned it. The reason they abandoned it is because they realized when they did their investigation as to why it wasn't working that the problem of the calls was not with the system. It was basically that people didn't have the skill or the confidence to have the type of conversations you need to have in order to keep performance going. So it's a classic example of an organization looking in the wrong place to try to solve the problem and prioritizing mechanics over humanics. And actually, it's very understandable because mechanics are predictable, they're tangible, they're measurable. People, on the other hand, they're messy. A manager in the very early stages of my own career took me aside and says, Ian, you're going to learn one thing about organizations. All problems come with hair on top. <laughs> or not, as the case may be. <clears throat> and it's actually true. And if you think about it, the only way to get anything done is through human interaction, whatever that is. And we've kind of tagged the idea of conversations onto Green Line because the lowest common denominator or base unit of currency of all interaction is the individual conversation. And if you think about individual conversations, when I talk about conversations in the current epoch, it's not just face-to-face -face anymore, obviously. It's not just the telephone anymore, obviously. It's not just meetings anymore, which are now virtual and global. But it's also inclusive of and trumped by, if you pardon the expression, um, the electronic conversation. So you put all of those channels together, and I've got a question for you. How many interactions do you think happen through those channels on a daily basis? I'm not even going to talk about Google. I'm just even talking about Ireland. I'm not even talking about Ireland. I'm talking about your own team. We had one client mad enough to undertake the challenge to investigate and come up with a number. And I'll tell you who the client was. The client was a retailer in Ireland, Primark, or pennies to you and I. And they, they discovered that there were 220,000 interactions that take place across their network on a daily basis. Now, the question I have, and it's a rhetorical question, is do you think that the quality of the conversations or interactions that are happening are having an effect or an impact on the business? OK. You don't even need to answer that one. That's not the audience participation point. <laughs> what we've discovered is that there are basically three outcomes to any interaction. And it's a little bit like, if it's a machine, then you need to drive it. And if you need to drive it, you've probably got a gear shift. And those of us who've got automatic cars, and anybody from the US wouldn't know what anything else is, I'm sure, is you've got three settings on your gear stick, right? So the first is D. You have the interaction. You have the engagement, you have the conversation, business moves on. There's a second category of interaction, N, neutral. Conversation happens and nothing happens. But there's a third category of interaction. And the third cate category of interaction is OR, which stands for? Reverse. Reverse. In green line language, we call it residue. Because what ends up happening is now, as a result of this conversation, poorly handled, poorly communicated or executed, now it's not just one conversation we've had. Now there's a multitude of conversations that escalate or ripple out from this. Now instead of having one meeting, we need to have a series of meetings. 
many of them unofficial and in car parks and in coffee coolers. Now instead of having a few people involved, it's escalated. Emails have gone out, CC, BCC, now the head of the department's involved. Oh, and by the way, if this is at home, it's your mother-in-law. <laughs> we call this residue. And residue actually has a cost. The way it shows up, and this is me kind of short-circuiting this, from our analysis of it, or our research, is it shows up in two camps. One impact of residue is it creates a lack of clarity. Or, and, it creates a second category, which is a loss of commitment. And these are some of the headings that it, that, that it has. And this is real. The interesting thing is that managers typically spend a portion of their time, guess what? Mopping up residue. Going around with a mop and a bucket, tidying up the result or the residue of things that could have, should have been handled more skillfully earlier on in the piece. People get paid to come to work to mop up. Highly paid in many cases. So does this resonate with you, by the way? Or does this never, ever happen here? Are you, are you residue immune? Or are you human? So if that's true, here's my question to you. And it'll be different from person to person. The question I have is, how many hours a week would you say, on average, the average supervisor, team leader, leader, manager in Google would spend tidying up residue? Have a reflection. So there's four categories here. And I'm just going to ask you to volunteer. How many of us would suggest or say no to five? How many of us would be in that camp? OK, three to four people. Oh, I've just given it away. <laughs> We're short on time, so I've just kind of shortcut it in. But at least we know the three or four people in the room who believe it's uh, less, than f less than six. Um, what would you say your average is? Would you be putting it in this category? Yeah. Would, that, would that be the general consensus here, somewhere in here? Yeah? The international average is about 12 hours a week. <clears throat> now. If we talk about residue and what causes residue, let me ask you, th so this, this is a, a piece where I'm interested in hearing from you, because it manifests itself differently in different organizations, but not too differently. And what I'm interested in is, if you had to come up with reasons why conversations go wrong, so if you want to go into the root cause and do your root cause analysis, what are the things that cause conversations to go wrong, typically, in your experience in Google here? Give me an example. Anybody? I'm just going to take anything from the floor. Not knowing what you want. OK. So not knowing what you want from the conversation. So not having a clarity. What else? Um, back and forth, doing things too quickly and then having to come back again and again. So doing things too quickly and, and then having to rework on, and, and do it again and again. We had over here? Not listening. Not listening. So people not listening. I was listening, by the way. I was just paying attention over here, but I get what you mean. Some hidden agenda from different parties. OK, hidden agendas from different parties. Not knowing like the why you're doing it. OK, so not only not, not knowing the what, but also the why. The wrong people in the room. The wrong people in the room. <laughs> Go on. So Google is human. Lack of context. Lack of context. OK, so context is either not, not or different for different people. Anything else? Was there a funny one here? Because we'd love to hear it. And no, it wasn't for me. OK. What we typically do when we work with groups is we take this information and we put it together. We take a sheet of flip chart paper, we take a red marker, and we write up everything that the group has got to, got, got to go through. And we put it, and we call it the red list. I'm going to come back to that in a second. So we'll take all of this, we put it in a red list. So I want you to imagine a big sheet of flip chart paper here with all the red stuff that includes what you've said plus much more that's, it, that, that's already in the room. Here's the interesting aspect of the whole proposition is we're very keen to go back to very simple first principles. And the very simple first principle about effectiveness, whether we're a leader or we're not. By the way, there's one thing that I forgot to mention is in the title of the talk, it says effective leaders. When I talk about a leader in this context, you don't need to be anointed or appointed 
with the title of leader for this to apply. And actually, even with leaders that we've worked with, when they come back and they tell us how this has worked for them, 80-20, they come back and tell us the human story of how it helps them with their 14-year-old daughter, with their relationship at home, with their whatever else. So even if you're not a leader in here, formally anointed, uh, as long as you're a human being and you've got a personal life, and I won't even ask you to put your hands up if you have or you haven't got one of those. <laughs> but as long as you have, then this applies just as well. And here is the, this is the reality of it, because it's a human reality. We have a situation where to get stuff done, unless it's self-directed and we're doing our own thing on our own time, a lot of what we need to get done is through other people. And you've got person A, which is my side, and you've got person B, which is the person on the other side of the bridge. And you've got a gap. And as those in Transport for London continue to insist, we need to mind the gap. <laughs> and that actually is the challenge. It is this fundamental human challenge. Because if it were as easy as this, we wouldn't even have a business. We're given a problem or a challenge to solve, and we've got to sit down and work it out. And there could be A, B, C, D, E, and F, perhaps, if it's a project or if it's a team meeting or whatever it happens to be. Very often, what happens is, instead of moving in the right direction, the problem or the challenge creates a tension, which is A versus B. Because I've got a view, I've got a history, I've got a perspective. Caroline might have something completely different on the other side. And we start to try to engage to solve the problem, <clears throat> and it creates a tension. And part of the reason it creates a tension is because of the red list. And the red list is real. And it's also human. And the thing that's fascinated us is that there's a policy and a procedure for practically everything. You know, if it's in the EU, there's a policy and a procedure for the shape and size of bananas. There are some organizations with, we've, we've encountered where there's a policy on soda. You can't bring soda into the building because it'll ruin their vending sales. There's another company that we work with where there's a policy on furniture removal because they're so, so <coughs> heavily unionized that if you want to move a desk from here to here, you've got to go and call the furniture removal people. So we have policies for all of this trivia. Yet we actually don't have an operating system for how to interact with one another to get a best, a best result or a best outcome. It doesn't actually exist until now. So the proposition is we, we know that this red list is real. We still have to solve the problem or the challenge. How do we navigate our way skillfully through what is present very often, and produce an outcome that isn't a residue outcome, but one which actually leaves us with clarity and commitment around the outcome. So we know it, exactly what it is we're supposed to do. We know what the context is. We know the why. We know the what. We know the how. We're committed to it. We have the same idea of it. And we go and we deliver it. And we're committed to doing so. That's the proposition. And the final thing before we get into the brain science, which I'm about to uh, share with you, is there's a cost to this, and organizations are really waking up to it. Let me give you a really crude residue calculator. We'll start off with the 12 hours. So we take the 12 hours. This is a real life example of an investment bank that we've worked with globally. So 12 hours times 48 weeks <clears throat> times average hourly salary globally times the number of people employed by the business globally, and you get a result. I did this presentation most recently to 300 CFOs who are not normally renowned for their interest in conversations or anything people oriented usually. <laughs> and we were flooded with inquiries on the back of this one slide that we've just given because they did their own maths with their own numbers and they came up with a very, very large number. Now those of us <clears throat> who aren't already gone on holiday for the weekend will appreciate that this number is only half of the real number. Because for every one hour that I'm spending tidying up residue, it's an hour that I'm not spending doing what is actually going to add value to the business. So it's a six-point game. If you get tired of the football analogy at any point, I can just switch metaphors. <clears throat> Let me share with you the model. The model is deceptively, but it's deceptively simple. It's based on a journey. So this is the green line model. And 
any journey that we have, people identify with this, so they relate to it very well. Because we're all on a journey. And whether it's a macro level life journey, whether it's a career journey that we're on, whether it's a relationship journey that we're involved in, we're all simultaneously on multiple journeys. And whilst the journeys are all different, the elements of the journey are all the same. So one of the things you need to have in a journey is you need to have a destination, which we simply call the there. It's somewhere where we haven't arrived at it yet. We haven't got there yet. It's over there, and it's not where we currently are. So that's one fixed point that we have in any journey. Second fixed point in any journey is where we currently are. You can take a snapshot in time of any moment, which is a here. If the language, by the way, gets too technical at any point, please let me know. <laughs> where? <laughs> that's in the middle. So how do you connect here to there? What's the fastest way? Straight, Straight line. We actually draw it as a dotted line because life teaches us that life never really works in a straight line. And interestingly, we have friends and clients in the aircraft business or airline business, <clears throat> and they would tell us that if you take airplanes, which most of us do a lot of the time, then the airplane's trajectory, it's, as, it's in the aircraft's interest to stay as close to that straight line as possible, for obvious reasons. The first is it's the most cost effective. Secondly, related to that, as you've identified, it's the fastest. Thirdly, beyond that, it consumes the least amount of energy. In this case, fuel, which is tied into cost. And finally, people get there faster and cheaper, so they're happier. So these could be the KPIs for any business, any industry. Interestingly, the aircraft's flight path doesn't stay exactly on the straight line. They tell us that actually it looks more like this. It kind of wiggles and wriggles from here to there, and it actually only intersects with the straight line or the optimal line 8% 8, 8 of the time on average. So 8% of the time it's connecting to the line, 92% of the time what's it trying to do? Get back on the line. It's a bit like Irish weather, it's either raining or it's about to rain, there's only two variables. <laughs> and you're either on the line or trying to get back on the line. And this is simple and easy enough in aircraft uh, territory. Because what they simply do is they put in the, the onboard coordinates, they onboard it of the destination, and then the GPS kicks in and makes the auto corrections all the way through. That's how the flight works. Green line just follows that metaphor, but in the people sense. So in order for green line to work, it, there are four key skills that we need to have. The first, which is obvious, but not common practice, is we need to create an agreed there. We need to understand what the purpose is. We need to understand what the destination is. We need to understand why we're doing it and what we expect as an outcome. So that's the agreed there, step one. <clears throat> the second thing we need to do is we need to be able to recognize when things are going off the straight line. Because sometimes if we're working together, somebody will always recognize first that we're going off. But it's the recognition of it. Sometimes it doesn't happen, the recognition, and things are way off before we realize it. So that's the second competency. The third thing that people need to do is they need to have, and this becomes the moment of truth, do I have the courage to call it? And this is very interesting from a cultural perspective. Because in some cultures, the culture is, or the habit of behavior, the received wisdom of how things get done around here is you never, you never speak out. And in some cases, people break down and they go the opposite extreme where people are speaking out all the time, but then nobody's listening. So, but there's an element where, do I, because there may be a tension that's created by speaking out or talking to somebody or bringing it up. That's a cultural issue. And finally, the final element of, is part of the reason that people often don't speak out or they don't step in to tap somebody on the shoulder and say, I think we need to redress this or we need to look at doing it a different way, is because they're not sure that they're going to leave the conversation or the relationship or the project in a better condition or even as good a condition as when they found it before they tapped in. So very often, very humanly, they'll decide to avoid. <clears throat> so this essentially is the, is the proposition or the metaphor. In 25 years of working across organizations globally, what we find, sadly, is not very much of this in reality. What we find far more is this. <clears throat> There's far more red line than there is green line. And you'll see the differences in many, many different ways, and we're going to dig into this now in a second. 
And the green line outscores the red in all four key areas, KPIs that we identified earlier on. <coughs> and there are many reasons why not. So the proposition for green line, which I'm going to share with you, there are seven red cards, and sorry, seven green cards, and the green cards are the mechanism by which we keep as close to the center line as possible and on the green line, navigating from here to there. Seven cards. And you've got a handout there, but we're going to come back to that now in a second. The red cards are the things that are most likely in interactions to cause the conversation to go onto the red line and therefore in the wrong direction. Before I get into the cards, I mentioned that my partner in founding Green Line is in the neuroscience game and there's a really robust set of neuroscience that underpins the cards. So I'm going to give you the 15 minute version of something which would probably take 15 hours if we had 15 hours. But I'm going to give you the short simple version of it because it's the weekend. <laughs> so um, the brain. How many of us have an interest in or an awareness of the function of the brain from a neuroscience point of view? How many of us have? Okay, not, not unusual and not surprising, so that's really good. So you can probably teach me a thing or two, even in addition to what I'm about to teach you. So for those of us who have or haven't, what I'm going to ask you to do is, uh, would you put your hand out like this and splay out your fingers and thumb? Okay, would you put your thumb in, wrap around your fingers, bring the fist towards your head, turn around and turn your fist and say, hi brain. <laughs> this is actually a pretty good working model of your brain in a couple of ways. Firstly, it's about this size, it's just a little bigger. It's about this weight, it's just a little heavier. And there are two component parts to it that are two functioning parts at minimum that work in parallel with one another simultaneously. The first is the thumb, which has one function. And this is the limbic of the older part of the brain, which is called the feeling brain. The fingers that wrap around the front is a more recent development, and that's the neocortex. And the two have you know, they work well independently, but actually together they can do an awful lot more, just like your fist. But they actually compete with one another, and their functions sometimes, they get mixed up. So, let me describe briefly what each does and where the risk is in the context of our conversation today and the cards. So, let's talk first of all about the, uh, the green brain. And the green brain is a cognitive system. Cognitive system is something where our logic, our ability for complex thought, our problem solving capability. So most of the time, from one end of the day to the next, this is on. We are solving problems, everything from programming all the way through to what am I going to wear in the morning or tonight or what am I going to have for lunch. This is constantly on. So when I say seven times seven, 49. Okay. That is a good demonstration. You've passed your MOT. Your problem-solving brain is working even at this time. So that's, you have to engage your problem-solving brain, solve a very simple problem like that. So that's the first thing. Second aspect of the, of the green brain is it creates context. What do, I, what do I mean by that? There are seven birds on a fence. You shoot one. How many are left? <laughs> okay, so the interesting thing is when you ask that question, it ranges from none to dead or alive, right? So there are many, many answers to the same question, and it all depends on one thing. Even the question dead or alive begs the, begs, begs the question, context. What is the context? So you change your context, you change the problem you see. Change the problem you see, you change the problem you solve. And we are infinite context makers. The human brain, each of us individually, is creating context every minute of every day. One of the challenges is we often think that when we sit down to have a discussion that we are operating from the same context. When you disagree, or you can't agree, or there's tension, or there's, there's an A versus B in the room, it is never about logic. We make the, mis the mistake of thinking that it's about logic, and my logic is better than your logic. Disagreement is never about logic. It is always about context. But by then, it's often gone too far. 
Let me demonstrate context. I've got two marbles here. Yellow marble is a dog. Blue marble is a car. Dog, car. Put the two together. It is impossible, practically, not to have a mental image in your head with a dog and a car in it, right? How many of us have got a mental image with a dog and a car in it, as I was describing it? OK. Um, how's your dog and car? Describe where they are. Yes, they sit down on the back seat and watching out from the window. OK, so the dog's in the back seat of the car watching out from the window. OK. Anybody else with something different? You imagine a dog getting hit by a car? You imagine a dog. Okay, so we got a car lover and a car, a dog lover and a dog hater over here. Yeah? What do we got? I have the car that has a dog exterior from Dumb and Dumber. Yeah. I know, I know exactly what you mean. Now I've got that picture in my head, it probably won't leave. Thinking like half transformer, so like the front side is a dog that runs and then the back is a car. No. So th this beautifully illustrates the fact that. All you need to do is introduce two pieces of data, and you can't help but create an image in your own mind. And it's different from person to person. So that's what I mean by creating context. So that's the second thing that the logical brain does. Interestingly enough, we have great capacity in this brain of ours. And depending on which piece of research you read, since the 1950s, it vacillates. We have the capacity in the cognitive brain to hold between not just two pieces of information like a dog and a car, but as many as between five and seven pieces of information we can hold simultaneously. Now, here's the question I have. If you can take six, let's say, we'll take the average, data packs, and you can hold them simultaneously, and you can spin and move these and manipulate them into any order or sequence which will create a different picture in your mind or your, your, your ability, this is the wonderful power that we have, computing power. How many options or possibilities do we have if we've got six variables? Who, who knows the math theory? Six variables, how many possibilities or options? It is six factorial. So it's six times five times four times three times two times one. That's exactly how many you have. You've got a total of 720 possibilities. So we have the ability or the capability with the thinking mind to engage with the world and make of it, with all the data that we've got, that many impressions, that many possibilities, that many opportunities, that many ways of looking at the same thing. It's quite remarkable. That's what makes us brilliant. But what makes us more brilliant is the final thing in the thinking realm. And this is what differentiates us from the animal kingdom is we have this ability to imagine future. This is a little bit like telling fish about water. Because we do this without even knowing that we're doing it. But we are the only mammal on the planet that can meaningfully think of a future that doesn't exist currently, imagine it to be the way it is, or isn't, work in the present, and make decisions and spin the marbles in creative ways that enables us to achieve what it is we imagined. Squirrels don't do this. <laughs> they don't gather around the squirrel family and say, last year, guys, we ran out of nuts. We're going to have to kind of delegate it out a bit better. We're going to have to create a spreadsheet, and we're going to have to figure out how we're going to get more nuts in so that next. No. What they do is they actually just go out. All squirrels instinctively go out, find nuts, and bury them. And they just hope that they've found and buried enough nuts that there's going to be enough nuts for the, nut, for the squirrel population to find. So it's a remarkable gift that we have. And actually, isn't this future orientation and this future capability the very essence of what leadership is? The ability to imagine something that doesn't exist and work at the present and even subsume. Because what, what happens is the brain organizes your marbles for you in order of, so it sequences priority. How do we, how do we sequence it? So when the cognitive brain or the green brain is operating, it sequences our brain and our thinking from there to here. So it enables us to make decisions in the present and even subsume some present desires for, the, for a better future and for the greater good. And we can make that decision in the now. 
it's what distinguishes us from the animals. So we are not the most, we're not the strongest mammal on the planet. We're not the most naturally armored or uh, most armored mammal on the planet. We're not the fastest, but we dominate the planet. And it's because of this ability to sequence our marbles from, from there to here. So that's on one side. On the opposite side, we have the feeling brain. And the feeling brain has got a completely different function. The feeling brain does not care about the future. It only cares about now. It's the older part of the brain. It's the limbic system. And it's like a 24-7, always on, surveillance system that is designed for one purpose only, to keep you safe. That's all it's got to do. So you're a zebra. You're grazing in the savanna. A lion jumps out. The last thing you want to do is begin to engage your thinking brain and think, I wonder, is it a hungry lion or is it lunchtime? I wonder, maybe we could make friends with the lions. And if we befriended the lions, we could probably, no, by then you're already lunch. So the red brain only wants you acting <coughs> and wants you acting as quickly as possible. In fact, how quickly the red brain reacts or activates 100 times faster than the time it takes to think a thought. Now, we can't even imagine how fast that is. But let me give you a demonstration of it. I recently had shoulder surgery on this shoulder. And when I came out from hospital, I had about 40 degrees of movement in any direction. So I could probably do this and this. And I was at home rehabilitating. And on my second day at home, I was walking up the stairs. And guess what? I tripped on the way up. So I'm in this situation I'm, I'm, and I'm going forward. Before I had any chance to do anything, guess what happened? Now, I don't know if you've ever had shoulder surgery and two days later and you had 40 degrees of movement, but you can probably imagine what the pain was like. But it didn't matter. Because whatever pain I was experiencing in the future was nothing compared to what I would have done if I'd crashed my head against the stairs on the way up. So, what had happened was the red brain had simply taken control. So if you imagine, it's like the cockpit to go back to the aircraft. You've got a pilot and a co-pilot. The green brain is like, has got the, one of them's got the controls. Most of the time, the green brain's got the control. But occasionally, when the need is there, the red brain takes over. It just moves in like a flash, takes over the controls, and makes decisions on your behalf to keep you safe. Why do you think it's 100 times faster than the time it takes to think a thought? survival. It's the older brain. It's the preservation of the species. So the interesting aspect about this is that <clears throat> it also has an impact. So your marbles are sequenced from there to here normally. But guess what happens when it takes over the controls? Have you ever been in a situation where you're in a meeting, somebody puts you on the spot, like asks you what seven times seven is in front of your peers and you know that sort of thing, and you're not expecting it. And all of a sudden, you mentally freeze. <coughs> and something that you, not, you just freeze. You can't, you give your best answer. You come up with the best thing that you can think of on the spot. You go off. 20 minutes later, guess what? You think of all the things you should have done, should have said, should have, should have, should have, should have. And as Ken Blanchard says, all of a sudden, you should all over yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but you only afterwards realize it because something has happened, and something has happened in here. So what has happened in here is that the red brain takes the controls, and guess what it does first? It resequences your marbles for you. And it does it very quickly. Fast enough for you not to hit your head on the stairs on the way up. So now instead of a there to here sequence, there's a here to there sequence. And the red brain, or the red marble, which is the here and now and survival, becomes the very first thing. The interesting thing about survival is that 21st century threats no longer are in the savanna. The 21st century threats that we have in Google and in our organizations and in our families are now represented in the team meetings and are represented in the project and are represented at home, around the family table, or between ourselves and some other sibling or whomever it happens to be. And now, when it kicks in, what we do is, in order to keep ourselves safe, the red brain's taken controls. We have to, in that moment, make a decision as to 
How do I stay safe in this environment? What have I do, got to do to get out of this? What have I got to do not to, not to lose face? What have I got to do not to take responsibility for this? And by the way, it gets better. So we got, we got our six marbles. If this lasts or persists, this state, for about 20 seconds or more, what ends up happening is a chemical cortisol gets released into the brain, which literally burns working memory. So it literally burns off your capability to think and the range of what you're capable of. And it narrows it down. So I've now just lost three marbles. I've gone from six marbles to three. I've lost half of my working memory. Three marbles. It's a trick question. It's not even a question, but it's a trick statement. Because I've got from six, which is 720 possibilities, three marbles. What are my possibilities now? Six. six. It's three factorial. I've literally gone from six marbles, <laughs> 720 possibilities, down to six. And the six now are so clear. Have you ever been in the situation where you were sitting at your desk and an email comes in and you go, that's the fourth time this week. I've got to do something about this. And you start to type. And you start to compose that email. And as you start to compose it, you get stronger and stronger. You get clearer and clearer. You're a wordsmith. You should be a po poet laureate. All of a sudden, it's just, I should have done this weeks ago. And the kind of energy surge that goes in through there. And you get to the point where you want to hit send. And what does it feel like when you're about to hit that send button? You just hit send, and you feel like you've just taken down the woolly mammoth. Until 20 minutes later, when somebody walks in with a copy of the email that you just CC'd to everybody and says, do you really send this, mate? By which time, the other marbles that had fallen on the floor have all the wall come back in, and you now have a perspective that you didn't have at that moment. Any of us here have got kids? Or access to kids? Because <laughs> I know, Caroline, you're going off to play with your uh, borrowed kids for the weekend. <clears throat> well, and seen them lose their marbles. Because if we've seen them lose their marbles, we have a situation where, let's say, we've got somebody who's five years old, they've lost their marbles, they're all over the floor, and we as parents have a strategy for dealing with this. Now, if you're a five-year-old kid and you've just lost your marbles and you're down to six options, you've only got three left, what is my ability as a five-year-old to have reasonable conversation in this moment? Very little. So what do we do as good parents? Well-intentioned, we reason with them. At what point do we realize that reasoning isn't going to work? Well, normally at the point where they literally drop one more marble, and then they race off to their room and they slam the door. <clears throat> because they've only got two choices. That's all they got. Because they feel more threatened, so they lose another marble. And we're just kids with longer legs. We think we're adults. We think we're sophisticated. But inside of us, there's that five-year-old kid. And the red brain is the red brain is the red brain when it comes to that. Now, I say all that to say that in most organizations, civil organizations, what tends to happen <clears throat> is people don't lose three marbles. It's pretty destructive. People comport themselves in ways, but it is fairly regular that people might lose one, one marble. What's the impact of losing one marble? The impact of losing one marble is, first of all, when the red brains resequence the marbles from, from here to there, what's the marble on the end that is going to go first? It's the green marble. It's the future-oriented one. So now we've got a situation where I'm in a situation where the least important element is the future outcome of what we're about to do here. The most important element is what, what I need to do to defend myself. And when I say lose one marble, one very simple example of what that would look like would be, you know the phone rings, and you pick it up, and it's that number. It's just that caller ID number that's on there. That's enough for you just to trigger and just lose one marble. Now you're going to have prepare yourself differently for that call, for that conversation, for that interaction than you would do, because you've just lost the future-oriented marble. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, if you lose one marble, you go from 720 options to how many? 120. You go to 120. You've just lost 600 options. 
and they're the ones that are most future oriented. As somebody who's had to lead and develop a business, it's very critical that if we're going to hire the best and the brightest, and the lengths that you go to here in Google and many other organizations to find, hire, and recruit the best and the brightest, we do that and they perform in their 720 <laughs> marble state. But what happens when people are under pressure? Because it's only then that you really begin to see how people perform and work under pressure. And we have lots of evidence of high flyers, high potentials, very talented people, very gifted people who round the organization are just walking around pulling pins out of grenades and leaving the grenade in the room and walking right out there <laughs> and causing devastation around them without even knowing that they're doing it. Simple hint, if you're down to 120, one way to help yourself and understand and self-diagnose, and this is very helpful for me, how do you know you've lost a marble? As soon as you find yourself mentally moving into what we call binary thinking, it's either you or me, it's either them or us, it's either yes or no, it's either black or white, it's either, as soon as you find yourself moving into a state where it becomes binary, Rest assured, you are now in a chemically induced state. <laughs> it's not a great time to be making decisions, which is why good negotiators at that level will always take breaks, and lots of them, to walk out to cool off for that 20 minute period so that they have got the perspective of the 720 possibilities and the 720 options. Leadership reputations get made or broken in these moments. Marriages get made or broken in these moments. So, that's the short science. Let's do the short version of the cards. So what we've done is, Blair and I, is we've endeavored to create a system to codify this operating system that will enable us, first of all, not to create situations where we're triggering, losing marbles, and we become suboptimal in our ability to make decisions, make choices, and also, how do we stay on the green line? How do we avoid going on to the red line? So, we're going to start off, and I'm going to spend most of the time in the remaining time that we have. Oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're a little short on time. How many of us have to leave at 3 o'clock? That's going to determine, okay? So, the very most of us. Okay. In that case, I'm going to show you a five minute video <laughs> and I'm going to ask you to have a look at the video through the lens of the red cards, if that's okay. So these are the cards. They're pretty self-explanatory and the five minute video that we're going to watch is a conversation between two people, A and B, who've got two different views of the same thing. And they've got to resolve a situation where Barry, who manages Lisa in a technical function, she wants to apply for a role which will promote her, but it, it involves managing people for the first time. He doesn't believe she's ready for it. She believes she's already demonstrated a capability and that she is ready for it, and they're in to have a discussion around it. We're simply going to observe it through the lens of Barry. So if you watch, watch the cards played by Barry, and maybe the impact that it's having on Lisa on the other side in terms of marble retention or marble loss. And once that's done, then we'll just wrap it all up. Okay, so this is the purpose of it. So I'm going to flip through the introductions and we'll just get straight on to the cards. So cards at the ready. I'm not saying that all of the cards appear and some of them might appear more than once. Let's see what you can see. Hello, Lisa. Hello, Barry. How are you? I'm well. And you? Good. Uh, so you applied for a promotion. Where are you at with the application? Oh, well, I, I haven't actually filled it in yet. Um, I wanted to come to you first and get your advice. Uh, how ready do you think that you are for this step? Oh, I'm, I'm definitely ready. I mean, I, I think I've proven myself in my current role. Mm -hmm. And I think I'll make a good manager, actually, if I'm given the opportunity. I am a key contributor. You say so yourself. Yes, you are goes without saying, you're, you're a great asset to this organization. Um, but how do you think that you would cope with the greater responsibilities? Oh, well, you know, it's I a big step when you move into uh, to people management. I remember when I was uh, promoted myself, I found it a big challenge. Um, there's a lot to take on. 
and uh, you know you're you're uh, you're managing people, you're coaching, you're uh, you're giving feedback, you're doing appraisals. It's it's a lot, you know, uh, and it takes a while to get it right. And uh, you have a lot of experience and a lot of management potential. Uh, are you sure you're ready? Well, I think so. Yes, I mean. I've seen a lot of people with a lot less experience and expertise get promoted in the past and they seem to be doing just fine. I think I'll uh, make a good manager actually. I, I'm looking forward to the challenge. I'm already the one people come to when there are issues and I'm often the one who has to point out issues before they impact the business and you know I think with a greater scope of influence I could influence the system instead of just helping people work around the inadequacies. Well, do you not think that there are a few things that you need to, to work on first? Oh, well, I'm, yeah, I'm sure there are. Such as? Well, for example, your communication style. Uh, how do you think you come across? I'm not really sure what you mean, Barry. Oh. I am a key contributor on this team. I'm the go-to person. I mean, I'm always willing to help and give advice, and I try to help them out the best way that I can. Our last team meeting, Kathleen wanted to make a suggestion about a uh, potential uh, change to the report. Do you remember how you spoke to her? No. Well, you were very condescending and you made her feel and look like a bit of a fool. Are you, are you aware of that? Oh, come on, Barry. Her idea, it was impossible. And you know it. I mean, she clearly doesn't know how the system works or she wouldn't have suggested it. I said what needed to be said and she got the message, didn't she? I mean, what, what do you want me to say? Uh, be quiet, say nothing, and, and let, the, the, let the business suffer? No, 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 not at all. Look, I, I, I just think that you're very direct with people, and, and that is not a, a style that, that suits people management. Look, um, I just think that, that at this moment, your, your leadership style suits more to an autonomous role. Would you, would you not agree with that? No, I don't. I want this promotion, Barry. I think I deserve it. But you, you know, obviously don't. No, 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 don't get me wrong. Look, Lisa, I, I think you're, you're a fantastic worker. You're, you're, you're a top contributor. I just, I want to support you in achieving your goal. Frankly, Barry, it doesn't sound like it. I just don't think that you're ready for this. Not, not at this moment. Lisa, you asked me for my advice. I'm giving it to you. And I think that we can, you know, work on developing your people skills, but in the meantime, maybe something comes up that doesn't involve people management. You know, I'm fed up waiting, Barry. I want this promotion. And I think I'm more than capable of managing people, actually. Look, if you really want to move into people management, uh, we can do a development plan. I'll look into some courses uh, that may be available and, and we can start there. How does that sound? Yeah, it's fine. Thanks. Okay. Look, why don't we meet in, in what, say, two weeks? Um, in the meantime, I can look into what courses are available. And, and I'll email you the link. You can have a look at those. Um, we can have a chat about then. How's that sound? Yeah, that's great. Okay. Good. Thanks, Barry. <laughs> when thanks doesn't really mean thanks. Now, interestingly, could you see the red cards at play? How many did you count? Four? Any advance on four? A seven. A seven. Okay, somebody got the full set. It's like bingo. Yeah. Um, any recidivists? Any kind of repeat, repeat offenders? Which ones? Asking leading, leading questions. questions. Yes, yes. Very often it's a master class in leading questions, that's for sure. Okay, so the interesting thing about it, we talked about operating systems, and this is where I'm going to finish, is that we all have a basic operating system. We use it. But we judge ourselves by the intention that we have, not the impact that it has on the other side. We either have an effective operating system or we don't. These seven red cards are the ones that are most likely to actually create the impact on the other side. Because what's the impact on the other side? Not, not very good. <clears throat> and in rating it, when you look at that conversation, if you had to give it a rating in terms of its effectiveness, how would you rate it here, looking at it through your own lens, neutrally? Two or three? Two threes is what I'm hearing? Okay. Barry now, on the other hand, goes to his management meeting <clears throat> and he sits down with Aidan and Aidan says, I know you had a difficult conversation to have. How's he rating it? Eight. Seven or an eight? You know, I gave her, the, gave her the feedback, I gave her the example, 
we got a plan, we're meeting in two weeks, I think I got away with it. Right? Yeah. Seven or an eight. Meanwhile, Lisa was tidying at her desk, Caroline inquires and says, well, you know, she's putting her effects into a box. How did it go? And she's rating it a what? A one. Well, it's definitely lower than we're rating it. So now you've got three versions of the truth, right? And there's only one that has, is legal tender, and that's Lisa's. But the sadder thing about it is, is that not only is the impact on Lisa a sad part of this equation, but it's the implication that there are Barrys walking around the organization pulling pins out of grenades and thinking they're doing a great job because they don't have an operating system. And he's not a bad guy. He's doing the best with what he has to get a result in a difficult situation. And this is as good as he's got. So guys, apologies for running four minutes and 28, 29, 30 seconds over because I normally castigate people for running over on my side of the fence, so I may have culpa for that. Thank you very much for the invitation, Caroline. Thank you very much.